Well, this course uh, has a, a long history, and uh, the, the purpose is really to, to uh, wonder with you uh, about uh, the potential effectiveness of environmental law. And I really want you to uh, imagine that uh, uh, we have no environmental law. Uh, by the end of the course, uh, I may ask you on a final exam to, uh, uh, to design a new system of environmental law uh, that would protect us against the problems that I'm going to run through with you. This is a, an unusual course in that most law courses uh, do not uh, uh, go through case histories the way that we will here, uh, so that uh, we, will, we will be reviewing perhaps uh, 12 or, or 14 different uh, case histories of specific problems. We'll be taking a look at the statutes that evolved in an attempt to manage those problems, uh, and I will give you my impressions about uh, how effectiveness might be judged, how efficiency might be judged, uh, and also really answer the basic question, which is what's worked, uh, what has not, uh, and why, as a way of thinking about how we're going to respond to a, a very new world uh, in which uh, you will face, your, your children will face, uh, your grandkids will face uh, approximately tw 10 to 12 billion people uh, creating uh, uh, more demand on resources, uh, more pollution, uh, rising rates of consumption, uh, rising rates of, of waste, how are we going to manage these types of problems? That's, that's the, really the uh, essential purpose of the course. You'll see on the syllabus that uh, I want to run through quickly with you uh, that uh, today I'll give you uh, an overview of, of uh, the material that we'll cover over the next several months. Uh, on Thursday, we'll review principles and strategies in environmental law, and I'll, I'll give you a, a quick Cook's tour of a variety of different statutes as well as the uh, decision standards that are embedded in those statutes. Uh, then we will uh, take a, a look over several weeks at, at the problem of national security in the environment and uh, really what happens when, when uh, uh, the military uh, uh, spends uh, uh, trillions of dollars per year uh, in the world. Uh, what, what happens to uh, environmental quality? <clears throat> the public sector has not been the target of 20th century environmental law, uh, but it has been a very important force in uh, shaping the environment that uh, we, we now are coping with. We'll look at nuclear experimentation, and uh, I've come to believe that uh, the atmospheric weapons testing program uh, of the 1940s and 1950s really is, uh, it's one, it demonstrates one of the greatest success stories that we have in environmental law. Uh, following the recognition that uh, the radionuclides that uh, were created and, and uh, uh, blown into the atmosphere uh, worked their way into the stratosphere, uh, they encircled the globe, uh, and when they intersected rain clouds, they would fall to earth. Uh, they contaminated the soil, they contaminated the uh, water supplies, they contaminated also uh, uh, food, uh, food supplies, agricultural crops, uh, and made their way to the dinner tables of everybody on the earth. Uh, the radionuclides eventually became embedded in human tissue. Depending on the nuclide, uh, it would uh, vary uh, between bone or, or fat tissue, uh, perhaps the liver. Uh, and pose uh, very well-known threats so that we'll, we'll review that story because there are really fundamental lessons of ecology, uh, fundamental lessons of, of environmental health uh, that uh, we've really forgotten. We've forgotten as we've uh, attempted to manage air, water, food, uh, as well as consumer product safety uh, or large tracts of land uh, so that uh, why, why have these lessons that uh, were very clear by 1963, why have we forgotten those lessons? That is the purpose of that segment. <clears throat> and for each of these case histories, I'll be uh, uh, reviewing the specific statutes that, uh, that uh, applied at the time uh, and talk about how they evolved and uh, give you a, a sense of how you would evaluate uh, whether or not they worked, uh, how effective they were. Uh, we'll take a look, too, at uh, preparation for warfare. It's not only the waging of war that creates uh, great environmental destruction. It's also the preparation for warfare, the training, the uh, production of, of weapons, uh, the enrichment of uranium. Uh, so that uh, if you look at the uh, 25 to 30,000 different military uh, bases and installations around the world, you'll see extremely severe contamination. Uh, so thinking about uh, how that should be managed, how it might be prevented, uh, will also be the subject of, of several lectures, uh, as well as site restoration. And so we'll be looking at uh, predominantly public sector issues in this first segment of the course. And then we'll take a look at the private sector, which has been the target of most uh, 20th century environmental law. Uh, we'll take a look at global markets and the challenge that they pose uh, in managing chemicals, uh, 
And uh, the management of chemicals is a very tricky business in that, that uh, it demands uh, a high degree of sensitivity about uh, where chemicals are, are released to the environment. Uh, where do they go? How do they move? Are they persistent? Uh, where do they end up? Uh, and how are people exposed? Uh, calculating the magnitude of exposure is really fundamental to understanding what the risk is. And most environmental laws are structured to manage chemicals uh, based on this idea of risk. Uh, so to understand the risk and to manage it, you have to understand all of these uh, intermediate issues such as where was it released, where does it go, how does it get into your environment, uh, and what are the likely health effects. And the word likely is very important because it, it implies uh, that uh, we need to be thinking probabilistically. Uh, what's the probability uh, of a damage, <coughs> of damage occurring down the road, whether or not it's ecological or, or human health related? So that, that uh, uh, we'll be thinking about uh, the different forms of law that uh, have evolved to, to try to deal with this kind of a problem. Uh, some set risk only standards, some are risk benefit balancing, some are cost benefit balancing, and more utilitarian in their structure. Uh, so what is the right standard to apply for very specific problems? Uh, we will then take a look at a variety of, of uh, issue areas, including uh, what I think of as industrial agriculture. Uh, the majority of our food uh, is highly processed. Uh, it is chemically dependent, uh, particularly on fertilizers and pesticides and preservatives and, and uh, dyes of different sorts. So uh, what does that mean? Uh, the food packaging industry is, is increasingly of interest to me in my own research. Uh, so I'll share with you uh, uh, several uh, uh, ideas about how plastics make their way into your life. Uh, right now, the synthetic chemical industry is dominated by the plastics industry. It constitutes 70% of the synthetic chemical industry in the United States. And each year, 100 billion pounds of chemicals are produced uh, and released to the environment. And among all plastics, among those 100 billion pounds, uh, only 5% are recycled. So we are building up a waste stream that uh, is coming back to haunt us. Uh, if I took tissue samples from each of you, probably 95% of you would have uh, residues of phthalates or bisphenol A, which are plasticizers in your body. Uh, and scientists, including uh, Hugh Taylor, right here at uh, the Yale Medical School, uh, is now recognizing that these are very effective chemicals at exceptionally low doses, part per trillion doses, in sending a signal to cells that estrogen has arrived or another hormone has arrived uh, so that they are uh, triggers of hormonal activity in many different species of animals uh, as well as humans. So what does this mean? Uh, in, in one way, it means that we're conducting quite a chemical experiment uh, on ourselves, uh, but also uh, on future generations. So what should we be doing about it? How should we be managing uh, uh, the chemical universe? This chemical universe, by the way, in international commerce, includes about 80,000 different compounds at present. Two to 3,000 new chemicals are produced uh, and released to the environment each year. And uh, they take many different forms, pharmaceuticals, uh, plasticizers, uh, different uh, metal compounds in uh, uh, millions and millions of different products. Uh, so that uh, these chemicals have uh, no mechanism in law, even in the United States, uh, to test what their effect is uh, and what the risk is might, the risk might be to uh, either uh, environmental quality or, or to human health. <clears throat> so what should we do about problems like that? We'll take a look at air quality law and uh, particularly the concentration of uh, the Clean Air Act on uh, really very few chemicals. Uh, there are six uh, chemicals that became the target of national air quality uh, uh, law and regulation. This is administered by the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and they decide which chemicals will appear on their radar screen. Uh, they decide uh, uh, what monitoring programs are necessary in order to uh, detect where they go, how they move, how they behave in the environment, and how dangerous they are, uh, who might be at risk. Uh, one good example of that might be diesel exhaust. And uh, you, you may know that uh, the older trucks, the less efficient diesel vehicles, uh, tend to uh, spew large particulate matter uh, from their, their uh, tailpipes, and uh, this, these uh, larger partic particulate, uh, particulates, uh, 10 microns in size and larger, are visible. It's one of the chemical threats that is visible. It's, a, it's one of the easier ones to identify. In fact, with diesel exhaust, you can not only see it, uh, you can taste it, uh, you, you can uh, feel it burning in the back of your throat. Uh, 
so most people understand uh, when they are exposed to diesel exhaust. Well, one of the uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, intents of EPA was to reduce the particle size, uh, to reduce the, the larger particles. And what happened when the engines became more efficient uh, to accomplish that was they produced more but smaller particles. So the finer particles, less than one micron in size. Not thinking that these finer particles can be more deeply inhaled into the lung. They reside there. They get stuck to the uh, sides of the airways particularly in uh, those that have background illnesses such as asthma, uh, emphysema, uh, lung cancer, uh, so that these particles uh, don't get expired, uh, so that exposure becomes more persistent. Uh, the danger to health is, is increasing. There's an interesting correlation, and I'm not saying that it's a causal relationship, an in interesting cor correlation between uh, the increasing number of these finer particles with rising rates of respiratory illness in the United States and in different parts of, of uh, the industrialized uh, uh, world. <clears throat> so that uh, uh, why might that be? Well, let me give you one analogy. If you, uh, if you thought about uh, an aquarium, and you fill that aquarium up, uh, regardless of its size, with softballs, uh, and then you, you uh, calculated the surface area of those softballs, uh, and then you took the softballs out, and you filled the aquarium up with, say, peas, and you calculated the surface area of the peas, uh, being analogous to the finer particle size. Uh, you'd find a, a many-fold increase in the surface area uh, <coughs> of the peas than you would of the softballs. And because the carbon particles that are these core elements of particulates, uh, because they're sticky, uh, they tend to lock on to a variety of different organic compounds, called volatile organic compounds, which are also regulated by EPA, so that uh, the carbon core becomes the vehicle for bringing a whole array of different chemicals into your lung, very, very fine particles in size. So that uh, there, <coughs> uh, many, many times, uh, uh, the absence of excellent scientific information uh, can lead the government into making decisions that are uh, actually not health protective uh, or environmentally protective. Uh, so we need to be very conscious about uh, the, the importance of doing excellent science, uh, not just uh, uh, science about uh, where chemicals move in the environment, but their effects on human health. If you went to EPA's website uh, and you look for the purpose of the Environmental Protection Agency, the number one pur purpose that you see on their website is to protect human health uh, from dangerous elements in the environment. Uh, that's kind of curious. Many people think of the environment as, as not being that, that closely associated with human health. Uh, we'll look at food safety issues, and we'll look at the rise of the organic food industry, which I believe is a, a very important success story in the 20th century, particularly uh, the result uh, of the, or, uh, the uh, uh, Food Production Act of 1990, uh, although there was a delay in, in uh, adopting standards for organic foods until, not, until the year 2000. But the organic uh, sector in the food market now is the largest growing uh, of any other sector besides bottled water if you include water in, in uh, uh, the food industry. And this, is, uh, this is very interesting. So the idea of, of certification, of government-sponsored certification, uh, as potentially creating uh, new markets uh, for products that are health-friendly or environmentally friendly. Uh, we'll look at the strengths and weaknesses of the certification scheme, uh, not just uh, related to food, but also to, to uh, paper and uh, forest products and a variety of other areas, uh, especially related to buildings. Uh, we'll take a look at the history of tobacco regulation, and there's a special legal paradigm that applies to tobacco. Uh, but again, it's one of these uh, types of, of threats to human health uh, and environmental quality that was really uh, uh, very uh, lightly treated, very lightly regulated uh, during the 20th century. And only now are we seeing uh, the Food and Drug Administration being empowered uh, to take uh, tighter control over the way that products are marketed. Uh, and we'll take a look at the advertising uh, strategies of, of tobacco companies and see a variety of similarities to other products such as toys or, uh, or candy uh, or different kinds of foods uh, toward children. Uh, so that, that uh, hooking children uh, early on uh, to uh, 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 try to, to cultivate their taste uh, toward foods that are high in salt and, and sugar and, and fat uh, there, there are some very interesting similarities there between the way that the tobacco industry was very anxious to encourage the youngest in society uh, to try tobacco products, knowing that exposures 
uh, for very short periods of time could, could uh, become addictive. We'll take a look after uh, spring break at uh, land use issues. We'll switch from chemical problems and pollution problems to land use issues. Uh, and we'll be uh, uh, particularly uh, interested in legal strategies for conservation, uh, different uh, approaches to set aside lands to protect biological diversity, uh, to protect watersheds uh, in an effort uh, uh, to uh, uh, improve environmental quality. We'll look also at wilderness and national park law. Uh, and a, a variety of other statutes that apply to the U.S. Uh, forest, national forest lands, uh, the Bureau of Land Management. And we'll also look at conflicts between uh, uh, land use and development and uh, the important value that we, we hold for private property rights in, in uh, our society. Uh, we'll also think about urbanism and sprawl and, and uh, different smart growth techniques to try to control uh, the, the uh, uh, rate of development uh, in, in suburban areas. Uh, we'll also look at uh, the idea of environmental justice, which uh, really uh, grows from a recognition of different groups, uh, different areas uh, 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 receiving or being exposed at a higher level to, to uh, either chemicals or, or uh, uh, different kinds of environmental insults. Uh, so that uh, we'll, we'll run through a variety of cases where groups claim that they are uh, more exposed, more at risk uh, than others, that they're bearing a disproportionate burden uh, of, of harm or, or threat. Uh, we'll also uh, look at the uh, uh, rising interest uh, and rising incorporation of LEED certification uh, into U.S. Uh, national and state law. So buildings are certified now to, uh, to uh, be green at different levels. Uh, the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies building, the new Kroon building, for example, uh, is applying for the highest level of LEED certification. It's called platinum. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at the evolution of uh, that certification scheme, and uh, uh, I'll be actually quite critical of, of uh, the scheme and the way that, that uh, standards are, are being uh, adopted by different governments uh, that become the foundation for the allocation of property tax breaks, uh, but also direct subsidies. Uh, from uh, uh, both the federal government and, and state governments. Uh, we'll take a look then near the end of the term at, at uh, past, the past and future of nuclear power uh, and the statutes and regulations that surround uh, nuclear power, uh, particularly the, the statutes that provided uh, uh, really large subsidies when compared to subsidies allocated to renewable energy sources. Uh, we'll take a look at a variety of different emissions trading schemes uh, and uh, renewable energy policies. Uh, and then end the course uh, with re a reflection across these different cases about what we've learned. So that's the game plan. And <clears throat> I wanted to spend just a couple minutes talking about course requirements. Uh, the course is structured to have a final examination uh, worth 40% of your grade. Uh, but also, uh, you, <clears throat> there is a paper or midterm option uh, that would constitute 50% of your grade. And then a, a discussion section will be held each week for 50 minutes. Uh, so everybody will need to sign up for a discussion section, and that would be worth 10% of your grade. I'll talk more as we move through the term about uh, the, the term paper option. Uh, there are four books that have been ordered uh, and uh, I believe are all in. If uh, There's one that uh, was shipped yesterday and should be in this afternoon. David Kessler's A Question of Intent, uh, which uh, provides a, a really wonderful review of the history of tobacco law and regulation. Uh, Michael Pollan, uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma. A good part of my career has been sp spent thinking about uh, food quality and food safety. Uh, so <clears throat> we'll, we'll uh, take a look at, at uh, Pollan's work. Uh, we'll read uh, also a book that uh, I published just uh, a few months ago called Green Intelligence uh, that uh, will run through a variety of these cases that, that uh, uh, we'll, we'll examine during the class. Uh, and then we will take a look at uh, uh, Weinberg and Riley's book called Understanding Environmental Law. So course themes that uh, I intend to uh, draw through these cases include uh, those that are on the back of page two, or, <coughs> or the bottom of page two. Uh, how is law related to science and, and uncertainty? Uh, what causes environmental damage and, and health loss? Uh, where should the burden of proof of causality lie? Uh, on the public sector uh, or on the private sector? On the individual? Uh, so that uh, understanding uh, the idea of burden of proof is a fundamental aspect of, of understanding environmental law. Uh, we'll also take a look at uh, the importance of secrecy 
uh, and the control over information or knowledge. Uh, so <clears throat> I think of this as being uh, really a, uh, uh, an analogy between the public sector and the private sector. In the, in the private sector, uh, secrecy is a very important component uh, in that uh, trade secrecy protects a company's uh, understanding of product ingredients or perhaps how it's uh, 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 processed or produced uh, or shipped, uh, whereas classified information in the public sector uh, protects sensitive information. Uh, in both cases, the idea is to protect competitive advantage either in international affairs or in the marketplace. So we'll see how that plays out in, in uh, many of these cases. Uh, we'll also think about uh, the, the principle of democracy and how participation rights vary uh, depending upon which law we're, we're looking at. Uh, and as participation rights expand, decision making becomes more complicated. And what that means is that it often slows down and it's, it's, harder, to, uh, it's harder to reach a, a mission of, of improved environmental quality. Uh, we'll look at property rights, uh, and uh, uh, rights in, in law are an essential component, uh, but also obligations uh, are an essential component. So when I, I, I think about law, I think about uh, uh, how rights are specified, how obligations are specified, you know, what are the sanctions applied for, for deviance, uh, and where does the perception of le legitimacy for that law come from? So we'll be asking those set of questions for each of the laws that we re review. We'll take a look, too, at the uh, principles of equality and, and justice uh, and, and uh, uh, spend a lot of attention uh, looking at uh, disproportionate allocation of burdens uh, or damages or pollution, uh, where uh, uh, dangerous facilities are located. Uh, we'll also take a look at the idea of risk and precaution. So what is acceptable risk? Uh, once it's calculated, uh, how do you determine what is acceptable? If you look across the laws, uh, uh, the different statutes have very different definitions of what acceptable risk is. Uh, we'll also think a lot about uh, the idea of precautionary law as opposed to util utilitarian law. Uh, so law that uh, builds in safety margins or buffer zones to protect against uh, miscalculations of risk. Uh, we did not do that when we built nuclear power plants and we've had several severe accidents in the world, most notably Chernobyl that we'll take a look at. Uh, when we look at the nuclear power plant case, uh, so that uh, thinking about uh, when should uh, the government be allowed to balance risks or, or costs uh, against benefits, and when should a, a fixed standard of allowable risk uh, drive a decision, those are very difficult questions. So that said, uh, I'd like to just briefly run through uh, some of uh, a set of slides here that, that I think are uh, uh, reflective of, of the material that uh, we'll be reviewing. And I wanted to start with uh, this image, uh, the set of images from Thomas Cole, a uh, well-known uh, landscape artist from the 19th century, uh, one of the Hudson River School painters. Uh, just to give you a sense of where I came from, uh, my background as an undergraduate uh, was in history. I had a fascination for English literature, but uh, also the history of art, uh, but a very uh, specialized form of art, which was uh, 19th and uh, early 20th century landscape art. And I was always fascinated by this series called The Course of Empire by Thomas Cole. Uh, and in the, in the very first painting on the lower left, uh, you see what's thought of as the savage state. And uh, uh, this is Thomas Cole's uh, obvious interpretation of the evolution of, of civilization. Uh, so the savage state uh, is wild. Uh, it's hostile. Uh, I think of it in a way as being uh, wild lands. And I've always had a, a strong fascination for wild lands. Uh, when I was a child, my dad always took me uh, uh, camping or, or hiking uh, up in the White Mountains in New Hampshire or uh, the Adirondacks or up in, uh, up in Vermont. Uh, and I always, I, it really caused me to, to have a, not just a fascination with it, but uh, also a love of it. Thinking about uh, how society might move from the savage or the wild state uh, to uh, the pastoral or the Arcadian state uh, is, is well depicted uh, in, in, uh, in this painting. <laughs> and many people, uh, when they're, they're shown a variety of different landscapes, uh, and, and uh, uh, if the, the landscapes vary between the uh, uh, highly uh, dense urban environment all the way to the wild environment, uh, they, uh, they prefer the pastoral, uh, the uh, agrarian uh, landscape. Uh, the consummation of empire is the, the 
the, the next s slide in the series, uh, the, the urban setting. Uh, and and uh, I also have had a fascination with, with uh, urban areas uh, and have lived in uh, Philadelphia, I've lived in New Haven, uh, I've lived in Sao Paulo and Brazil and in San Francisco uh, and eventually settled here in Connecticut. Uh, but uh, it's this juxtaposition that uh, I find uh, so interesting. Uh, a love for the wild as well as a love for a vibrant urban core. Uh, and uh, what happens in between in terms of suburban sprawl will become uh, central to, to several of the cases that we look at. Cole then th went, went on to think about, uh, well, uh, what happens uh, if, if markets are completely unregulated uh, destruction, damage? So we'll spend a good amount of time thinking about uh, how to predict damage and how important this is in the, uh, the structure of environmental standards. And then desolation. And many today have this image of desolation uh, 100, 200 years down the road uh, in response to uh, global climate change. So uh, really, uh, uh, this, this set of uh, paintings uh, uh, structured my thinking in, in a variety of different ways. Uh, it made me wonder about uh, what the potential of law is. Uh, what capacity do we have to understand serious threats uh, to the environment and to human health, uh, particularly over long periods of time? Uh, what demands on science does that make? And how can we use law to effectively reshape human behavior in a way that would be more sensitive, uh, that would uh, ensure that uh, when we have 12 billion people in the world, uh, that we will have adequate food supplies, we will have sufficient water, uh, it will be equitably distributed, uh, we will have clean air, uh, and children, uh, grandchildren, future generations uh, will have uh, an environment that uh, they can be proud of. I am certainly not proud of the environment that my generation is leaving to your generation, and that really is, uh, that's the reason that I'm standing here in front of you today. Uh, I've decided uh, in my career that, uh, uh, you know, rather than working for government, rather than working in the private sector, uh, that I would spend uh, my life, uh, the bulk of my career, training uh, future leaders, whether or not uh, you move on into the public sector, the private sector, nonprofit world, uh, to think, I hope, differently about uh, environmental quality. And, and how you might uh, how you might shape it. So the central questions here that uh, we'll be looking at: What's our capacity to manage environmental quality? Uh, what role has and could law play uh, in determining the future of environmental quality? Uh, and what's worked well? Uh, what's failed, and why? If we can't answer these questions, uh, I would uh, uh, hazard to say that that uh, we don't have much hope of of making a dent in the kinds of problems that we'll be facing. Uh, over the next century. So the problems considered in the course, national security, land use, food safety, plastics, green building, pesticides, air pollution, tobacco, wildlands, national parks, coastal development, conservation policies, urban and suburban growth, transport, energy, and drinking water. In my mind, what's worked well and why? Well, uh, the nuclear weapons history, I think, is quite fascinating. There's some wonderful lessons there about how we used uh, state-of-the-art science in, in uh, the 1950s uh, to recognize a serious threat uh, to human health and how we intervened and, and uh, eventually uh, how John F. Kennedy decided uh, to ban the use of uh, uh, the testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere uh, that was resulting in strontium-90 in the bones uh, at high concentrations, particularly among the youngest, uh, the children. Population control has been a, a success. Uh, compared to the projections of the 1970s by Paul Ehrlich uh, and Julian Simon and others, uh, it's quite striking uh, that the, the uh, uh, geometric projections uh, have diminished substantially, uh, particularly in developing parts of the world. Uh, the phase out of chlorinated uh, hydrocarbons, uh, including DDT and aldrin and chlordane and, and dieldrin, heptachlor, uh, back in the uh, 1970s, uh, th these became one of the very first targets of the Environmental Protection Agency. And because they uh, are fat-loving, they're lipophilic, uh, they persisted, they moved through the food chain, uh, they moved into, uh, into our bodies, uh, and uh, you and I are still carrying around residues of many of these chlorinated hydrocarbons. Uh, your concentrations are lower than mine are, uh, but your concentrations predominantly came from your, your mother uh, via breast milk. Uh, that's the, uh, the, the mechanism of transfer across generations for some of these compounds. Uh, so phasing them out was a very important thing to do. Lead and gasoline and paint uh, were phased out as well. Chlorinated uh, uh, fluorocarbons uh, 
that were uh, and are responsible for diminishing the uh, ozone uh, that layer that exists in the upper stratosphere uh, so that uh, uh, reducing CFCs and similar ozone gobbling compounds has been a success story. Uh, at least at the uh, rate of loss has been stabilized. Uh, polychlorinated uh, biphenyl reduction, these are chemicals originally thought uh, to be beneficial uh, because they acted uh, as a, a, a refrigerant and flame retardant for electronic uh, 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 technologies such as uh, electrical transformers uh, so that, that uh, phasing out PCBs that were building up in the tissues of wildlife uh, particularly large mammals as well as birds uh, and also in human tissues has been a very important success story. Uh, recognizing the threat of asbestos and producing a very rare form of cancer called me mesothelioma uh, was a very important step uh, as well as the increasing restriction on tobacco uh, so that we're seeing a, uh, a decline in, in uh, 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 some forms of lung cancer uh, in response to the tobacco restrictions and uh, we're also seeing very interesting uh, declines in the rate of addiction uh, in those parts of the country uh, where advertising has been most heavily restricted and uh, public service campaigns have been mounted to uh, warn people about about the dangers of tobacco. Uh, we've also made uh, some great strides in the area of food safety particularly uh, in, in terms of reducing microbial contamination and also the uh, uh, the st uh, stellar success story about the rise of organic food uh, I think is, is something to uh, uh, take note of and to, to learn from. Uh, so what are the most persistent problems, uh, the ones that have been hardest to deal with uh, and why? Fossil fuel consumption, uh, renewable energy innovation, uh, in part uh, due to our, our lack of, of subsidies uh, relative to, to uh, subsidizing fossil fuels as well as nuclear power. Uh, radioactive materials, uh, the concentration of, of radioactive materials, uh, particularly for the production of, of weapons uh, has created some of the most hazardous sites in the, in the world. So Hanford, Washington, uh, uh, the Hanford Works in Washington, as well as uh, the Oak Ridge Laboratory or uh, Savannah River uh, in Georgia, these are seriously contaminated sites. Uh, waste management uh, has also been a, a, a persistent problem. Our recycling efforts have clearly failed us. Uh, most people don't know the difference between a plastic that is stamped with a number six and a plastic that is stamped with a number three. And uh, uh, I'll be, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, challenge you right now to go through one week of this term without buying any plastic. Uh, and uh, if anybody is capable of doing that uh, by the end of the term, um, I will take you out for lunch. Uh, I've, I've made that offer for the, the, the past five years, and uh, I've not spent one dime on lunch. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as a result. Transport, uh, personal transport as opposed to uh, uh, public transit facilities is a persistent and growing problem. Uh, we now have one vehicle in the United States for every person who is eligible to drive. That's nearly 250 million vehicles. Uh, we have more vehicles per capita in the United States than any other place in the world and we, more, we drive more miles per person than any place in the world. Uh, the the uh, failure to develop public transit facilities is, is quite striking. Uh, parks and protected areas, we are not protecting areas the way that we were back in the 1970s and the 1980s. So why have we slowed down? Why was the government uh, uh, in the process of acquiring lands in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s uh, and uh, building parks and building large corridors for wildlife to, to conserve uh, biological diversity, but also to provide wide-scale recreational opportunities. So why have, uh, why have land acquisition efforts uh, been stalled? Uh, biological diversity loss uh, is also growing in part uh, because of, of uh, the chemical threats that I described earlier in the lecture. Uh, there are nearly 450 million acres of the United States landscape that are routinely sprayed by biocides, pesticides, uh, of one sort or, or another. There are a thousand different biocides that are each licensed independently. Uh, so at that scale, uh, how could we not think uh, that we would be threatening different species? Also agriculture. Uh, one of the great drivers of loss of biological diversity in the world is agricultural development. Uh, you can see this in, in uh, the Amazon, uh, where tropical rainforests that are some of the richest and, and most biologically diverse ecosystems in the world are being ripped up and, and planted uh, with soybeans. Uh, 
uh, for either uh, food or, or fuel production. So we'll, we'll take a look at uh, some of the key drivers behind biodiversity loss. Uh, marine species exploitation, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at the uh, decline of, of uh, a variety of commercial fish. Uh, we'll also be taking a look at uh, the, the uh, tendency about large, uh, uh, the tendency of large predatory fish uh, to absorb mercury. Uh, so mercury is emitted from power plants. It's also em emitted from incinerators. It goes into global circulation just like uh, uh, DDT would. Uh, it also uh, rains down on the earth uh, and it bioaccumulates uh, in large predatory fish. Uh, by the end of the term, you'll understand which fish uh, are, are safe and, and which are not and, and why. And uh, you'll also question the, uh, the Bush administration's decision uh, to lighten the regulation on mercury emissions uh, and how dangerous that uh, uh, has become, particularly for the youngest in society. We'll take a look at indoor air quality. And uh, one aspect of, of uh, uh, this issue that I'm quite, uh, quite interested in is uh, the Environmental Protection Agency spends probably 95 to 98 percent of its time and budget thinking about the environment uh, as being the outdoor environment. Whereas we in the United States now spend on average uh, more than 90% of our time indoors. And as somebody that uh, uh, is a dad and, and uh, cares about uh, the, the future of, of the environment and, and human health, uh, that, that's got me worried. Uh, people are, are spending less time outside. Uh, they're experiencing uh, nature uh, at a, a lower uh, rate than ever before. Uh, they are spending more time in front of computers uh, in indoor environments than ever before. Uh, and EPA does not do much to regulate the environmental quality of indoor environments. Uh, so the, the reasons for that are, are uh, uh, sometimes uh, obvious and, and sometimes not. Uh, one clearly is a respect for uh, privacy and, and uh, private property rights, uh, but it means that, that uh, anybody is allowed to carry uh, chemicals into the indoor environment, including cleansers or pesticides uh, or plastics uh, that can get into their bodies. Uh, and there is basically no regulation to prevent that. Uh, hazardous sites, the, uh, the, the number of hazardous sites uh, now in the United States is, is uh, more than 350,000 on EPA's list. There are 50,000 different hazardous sites that have been severely contaminated uh, that are under the jurisdiction, meaning the responsibility, of the Department of Defense, uh, the Department of Energy, and the uh, Department of the Interior. There are 300 and 40,000 sites uh, that are owned in the private sector that have been classified by EPA as hazardous. So the, the rate of cleanup of these sites uh, is, is not even 1% uh, of uh, the rate of discovery of new hazardous sites. So th this problem uh, of basically uh, disregarding uh, the chemical abuse of the landscape, uh, feeling comfortable to throw uh, chemical mixtures out, uh, out the back door, uh, without concern for uh, their persistence and, and movement. Uh, this is something that uh, your generation will have to deal with. Uh, product labeling uh, will also be a, a subject that we'll take on. Uh, basically, if, if uh, you look carefully at product labels, uh, you'll see claims of, of product effectiveness, uh, product uh, uh, appeal uh, associated with, with uh, color or, or uh, functionality. Uh, you will not see much in the way of claims or uh, 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 demonstration of hazard or, or guidance about how you might manage the hazards. Uh, so that uh, product labeling could be an effective way of conveying information to the public uh, to inform consumers to make choices that are more responsible. So how should we adjust product labeling law in a way that makes sense? I asked this question with respect to pesticides several years ago and, and uh, found something quite interesting. You look at a pesticide bag, for example, uh, a fertilizer bag in, uh, uh, say, a, a Home Depot. Uh, you'll see the green lawn with the children playing on the lawn in bright colors on the front of the bag, and in the back of the bag in, in print that uh, may be eight point, it may be six point in size, uh, print that I have to take my glasses off and, and get very close to to be able to read, uh, the warnings are uh, ille illegible. Uh, and unintelligible to a very large proportion of society. And uh, there are some 12% uh, of the U.S. population, not an insignificant number in a population of 310 million people, uh, 
uh, so 10 percent, uh, that have no capacity to read type that is less than uh, 10 point in font. That means that those warning labels uh, could never be effective for that population. If you add on to the, uh, that percentage, the group that is illiterate, uh, the group that does not have enough education uh, in order to understand how they might, uh, uh, what the risk is and how they might manage the risk, uh, gradually you get up to a percentage that's close to 40% of the U.S. population does not have the capacity uh, to understand a message of hazard uh, or the capacity to interpret how to manage that hazard in a way that would uh, cause the environment to be protected or human health uh, to be protected. So the uh, statutes we'll look at, I'm not going to go through all these now, but uh, we'll go through the, the, the major statutes uh, and the, uh, the book Weinberg and Riley will give you a very concise, quick overview of the key provision of these statutes. Uh, and I will show you how the statutes uh, apply individually to the, to the, very, uh, the various cases. Uh, we'll take a look not just at the chemical management statutes, but also the federal land and resource management statutes, such as the Wilderness Act, the Endangered Species Act, uh, the National Park Service Organic Act, and uh, several others. Additional crucial statutes that you might not think about as being environmental in nature uh, include patent law uh, governing trade secrecy, uh, the Freedom of Information Act uh, that uh, gives you the right to, to request from the government information uh, about public policy or about uh, uh, the environment. And I'll, I'll pause here and just ask how many of you uh, have made requests under the Freedom of Information Act to a government agency? It's very interesting. The majority of people that do that in society uh, are highly specialized. They work in the private sector uh, or they are lawyers. They're using them as basis for lawsuits. Uh, so the Freedom of Information Act was intended to democratize information uh, that was held inside uh, libraries and, and government agencies, uh, but it's been highly ineffective in a variety of ways. The National Security Act, the War Powers Act, the Administrative Procedures Act, Homeland Security, the Patriot Act, and different budget uh, statutes, uh, as, uh, from ranging from subsidies to, to uh, uh, authorizations uh, for funding for EPA. Uh, and these statutes are, are absolutely crucial. So you can imagine a, uh, a law being passed uh, that, uh, let's, say, let's say the law had the intent uh, to protect uh, uh, the environment from uh, a new plastic compound. So that uh, uh, that law might be, plas might be passed and it might demand uh, that the chemical uh, be tested thoroughly. Uh, it might demand that it be uh, labeled in a way that uh, uh, would ensure that uh, uh, it would be uh, managed uh, more effectively. It, it, might be, uh, 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 it might assign penalties uh, for deviance. But in Congress, if Congress doesn't allocate the money to EPA, the program will fail. So, the industry recognizes this quite clearly, that they have not lost the battle uh, if a law is passed. Uh, they will have an opportunity year after year to go back to Congress and try to block allocation for monitoring that issue, uh, for enforcing that issue, uh, and that explains a lot of the ineffectiveness of 20th century environmental law. So uh, on Thursday, we'll come back to a uh, discussion about different types of strategies uh, to to protect the environment, different decision standards that are embedded in uh, different uh, statutes, uh, and we'll particularly take up this issue of, of distributional effects, how some chemicals uh, uh, behave differently than others, they result in exposures to some groups that are higher than others, uh, and also uh, thinking about how uh, costs uh, as well as benefits are allocated uh, quite differently in society by environmental laws. So, I'm going to pause there and uh, just take a couple of minutes uh, for any questions that you've got. Yes? Could you say, repeat that, please? Yes. Uh, the, after the lecture, each day, uh, the lecture slides will be posted online. Also, I will uh, use the, the uh, classes server quite regularly. Uh, some of the readings that you will have assigned to you will be on the classes server uh, so that some of the discussion sections as well may, may uh, use strategies to uh, uh, pose questions and uh, uh, require your responses on the classes server as well. Yes? Will you hold office hours? Well, I hold office hours. I will hold office hours and I will announce those on Thursday.
Anything else? Well, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, rising rates of, of waste, how are we going to manage these types of problems? That's, that's the, really the uh, essential purpose of the course. You'll see on the syllabus that uh, I want to run through quickly with you uh, that uh, today I'll give you a, an overview of, of uh, the material that we'll cover over the next several months. Uh, on Thursday, we'll review principles and strategies in environmental law, and I'll, I'll give you a, a quick Cook's tour of a variety of different statutes as well as the uh, decision standards that are embedded in those statutes. Uh, then we will uh, take a, a look over several weeks at, at the problem of national security in the environment and uh, really what happens when, when uh, uh, the military uh, 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 spends uh, uh, trillions of dollars per year uh, in the world. Uh, what, what happens to uh, environmental quality? <clears throat> the public sector has not been the target of 20th century environmental law, uh, but it has been a very important force in uh, shaping the environment that uh, we, we now are coping with. We'll look at nuclear experimentation. And uh, I've come to believe that uh, the atmospheric weapons testing program uh, of the 1940s and 1950s really is, uh, it's one, it demonstrates one of the greatest success stories that we have in environmental law. Uh, following the recognition that uh, the radionuclides that uh, were created and, and uh, uh, blown into the atmosphere uh, worked their way into the stratosphere, uh, they encircled the globe, uh, and when they intersected rain clouds, they would fall to earth. Uh, they contaminated the soil, they contaminated the uh, water supplies, they contaminated also uh, uh, food, uh, food supplies, agricultural crops, uh, and made their way to the dinner tables of everybody on the earth. Uh, the radionuclides eventually became embedded in human tissue. Depending on the nuclide, uh, it would uh, vary uh, between bone or, or fat tissue, uh, perhaps the liver, uh, and pose uh, very well-known threats. So that we'll, we'll review that story because there are really fundamental lessons of ecology, uh, fundamental lessons of, of environmental health uh, that uh, we've really forgotten. We've forgotten as we've uh, attempted to manage air, water, food, uh, as well as consumer product safety uh, or large tracts of land. Uh, so that uh, why, why have these lessons that uh, were very clear by 1963, why have we forgotten those lessons? That is the purpose of that segment. <clears throat> and for each of these case histories, I'll be uh, uh, reviewing the specific statutes that, uh, that uh, applied at the time uh, and talk about how they evolved and uh, give you a, a sense of how you would evaluate uh, whether or not they've worked, uh, how effective they were. Uh, we'll take a look, too, at uh, preparation for warfare. It's not only the waging of war that creates uh, great environmental destruction. It's also the preparation for warfare, the training, the uh, production of, of weapons, uh, the enrichment of uranium. Uh, so that uh, if you look at the uh, 25 to 30,000 different military uh, bases and installations around the world, you'll see extremely severe contamination. Uh, so thinking about uh, how that should be managed, how it might be prevented, uh, will also be the subject of, of several lectures, uh, as well as site restoration. And so we'll be looking at uh, predominantly public sector issues in this first segment of the course. And then we'll take a look at the private sector, which has been the target of most uh, 20th century environmental law. Uh, we'll take a look at global markets and the challenge that they pose uh, in managing chemicals. And uh, the management of chemicals is a very tricky business in that, that uh, it demands a uh, high degree of sensitivity about uh, where chemicals are, are released to the environment. Uh, where do they go? How do they move? Are they persistent? Uh, where do they end up? Uh, and how are people exposed? Uh, calculating the magnitude of exposure is really fundamental to understanding what the risk is. And most environmental laws are structured to manage chemicals uh, based on this idea of risk. Uh, so to understand the risk and to manage it, you have to understand all of these uh, uh, intermediate issues such as where was it released, where does it go, how does it get into your environment, uh, and what are the likely health effects. Well, this course uh, has a, a long history, and uh, the, the purpose is really to, to uh, wonder with you uh, about uh, the potential effectiveness of environmental law. And I really want you to uh, imagine that uh, uh, we have no environmental law. Uh, by the end of the course, uh, I may ask you on a final exam to, uh, uh, to design a new system of environmental law uh, that would protect us against the problems that I'm going to run through with you. This is a, an unusual course in that most law courses uh, do not uh, uh, go through case histories the way that we will here. Uh, 
uh, so that uh, we, will, we will be reviewing perhaps uh, 12 or, or 14 different uh, case histories of specific problems. We'll be taking a look at the statutes that evolved in an attempt to manage those problems. Uh, and I will give you my impressions about uh, how effectiveness might be judged, how efficiency might be judged, uh, and also really answer the basic question, which is what's worked, uh, what has not, uh, and why as a way of thinking about how we're going to respond to, to a, a very new world uh, in which uh, you will face, your, your children will face, uh, your grandkids will face uh, approximately tw 10 to 12 billion people uh, creating uh, uh, more demand on resources, uh, more pollution, uh, rising rates of consumption. The word likely is very important because it, it implies uh, that uh, we need to be thinking probabilistically. Uh, what's the probability uh, of a damage <clears throat> of damage occurring down the road, whether or not it's ecological or or human health related, so that that uh, uh, we'll be thinking about uh, the different forms of law that uh, have evolved to to try to deal with this kind of a problem. Uh, some set risk only standards. Some are risk benefit balancing. Some are cost benefit balancing, and more utilitarian in their structure. Uh, so, what is the right standard to apply for very specific problems? Uh, we will then take a look at a variety of, of uh, issue areas, including uh, what I think of as industrial agriculture. Uh, the majority of our food uh, is highly processed. Uh, it is chemically dependent, uh, particularly on fertilizers and pesticides and preservatives and, and uh, dyes of different sorts. So uh, what does that mean? Uh, the food packaging industry is, is increasingly of interest to me in my own research. Uh, so I'll share with you uh, uh, several uh, uh, ideas about how plastics make their way into your life. Uh, right now, the synthetic chemical industry is dominated by the plastics industry. It constitutes 70% of the synthetic chemical industry in the United States. And each year, 100 billion pounds of chemicals are produced uh, and released to the environment. Uh, 